Hi, welcome to the Ethereal Mechanics Foundation Series Introduction Video. A long time ago, in a basement far, far away, I asked a simple question. How do you compute the inductance of an inductor? An inductor is the simplest electronic component. It's, it's simply just a loop of wire, or even a coil of wire. And why did I ask this question? Well, I came across a news story, I don't know if it was a, what medium it was on, where scientists claim that the springiness and stretchiness in materials is due to Coulomb forces. In other words, electrostatic is what causes the springiness and stretchiness in materials. And that blew me away because one thing I learned when I went to engineering school is that we have a thing called analogs. And in electronics, the analog for a spring is a capacitor. The analog for friction, in this case, this model here, would be the viscosity of the mass moving through the air, which will sap the energy out of it, which is a form of friction. The electrical analog for friction is a resistor. Sorry, there's two resistors shown here. It's clip part. I couldn't find a single resistor. And the electrical analog for inertia of the mass is an inductor. And so you have these physical models here. This is, you know, the Y is the position of the mass as it moves up and down. And the position of the mass times the spring constant gives you the spring that the, the force spring. The first order derivative, this is why this is called the first order equation, of Y multiplied by the coefficient of friction gives you the frictional force. And the second order derivative multiplied by the mass, which is uh, the inertia, gives you the inertia, inertial force of this system. And that, in the electrical realm, you can see that we use charge to represent position and voltage to represent force. And you can see that the equations look identical in form. You've got your first, your zero order derivatives, your first order derivatives, and your second order derivatives. And except for the fact that you've got charge instead of Y and resistance instead of frictional coefficient, you basically can mimic exactly this system, this physical system, with an electrical system. And that blew me away. Okay, so if the mechanism of the capacitor and spring are the same mechanism, not just analogs. It, really, the mechanism that works makes a spring work is the same exact mechanism that makes a capacitor work. Well, then I said, well, why can't the mechanism of inertia be induction? And why should you care about that? It's because of this. Why? Because the unified field theory, also known as the theory of everything, is something scientists have been looking for since forever. And it all started because Maxwell allegedly unified electricity with magnetism. He didn't really unify them. That's a whole other story. I'm not going to go into that. But essentially, what came out of this early research is that you could create magnetism from electricity, and you can create elect uh, electricity from magnetism. And that's cool. You can make electricity with a magnet. You can make magnetism with electricity. That's awesome. And Einstein found a link between gravity and inertia. And the holy grail of science is find the link between electromagnetism and gravity. Because in theory then, you should be able to create gravity or inertia from either electricity or magnetism, and vice versa. And therefore, you could have electromagnetic propulsion for starships instead of sending man into space on the top of Roman candles. And I said, gee, could it be so simple that it's been right in front of our face all the time? that inertia and inductors work on the same exact force. It could be the same. And so I got really excited. This happened 20 years ago. Hello, my name is Robert Distinti. I'm an electrical engineer with over 30 years experience. And this video series comprises the early experiments in rationale that eventually became the foundation for ethereal mechanics. So, but one thing that we have to have if we're going to do this is we need force models for individual charges. I mean, conceptually, if, you know, these, these are circuit models that we showed before, these circuit models 
work on individual charges, groups of charges. So then logically, there should exist field models that apply among point charges. And this is a fancy notation for saying that there should exist a force where constant times a function of charge and position, another force where some constant times a function of charge and velocity, so the first derivative of position is velocity, Okay, and the second order derivative of position is acceleration. So we should have a second order, if we got a second order system in circuits, we should have a second order system that relates charge to the second order effects of position, of velocity, and acceleration. And when I went to look, there's only one Coulomb's model that relates charge to position. Okay, there might be another one here, but I wanted to start here, obviously, because that was where the Holy Grail is. So I didn't really pay much too much attention to this one. There might be something I didn't look for. This is the early days. I'd started here, and I said, well, okay, well, how do I make a, from the existing field models, how do I make, reduce it to just an effect among point charges? That was the ultimate question. And there were only two possibilities out there that could apply charge acceleration, which in circuits is a changing current, to charge force. That's Faraday's law and vector magnetic potentials. And so for Faraday's law, okay, not too bad. If I have a accelerating charge and this dual arrow is my symbol for an accelerating charge, it's going to create a changing magnetic field and that changing magnetic field can coil, couple to a coil of wire and it, we would know then the EMF acting on the charges in the target loop. And that's fine. So here we have the source of the magnetic field can be expressed as a point charge. And this point charge could be part of another loop or it could be part of an open loop. It didn't matter. So the, the source of what causes induction is no problem. It's all, it, it can be reduced to a point charge. Okay, but the problem is, is that for Faraday's law, in order to calculate the effect on the target charges, they have to be constrained to a loop. And what happens if you remove the loop? You can't determine. The, the model is indeterminate. It doesn't tell you what will happen. Because unless you know the flux contained by the loop, you can't know the effect on the charges. And I said, that's ridiculous. So we only have a model that works on the target side if the target charges are part of a closed loop? That's ridiculous. Therefore, the effect from, from both Faraday's law and vector magnetic potentials cannot be reduced to the effects between point charges. And charges are the most fundamental building block of electromagnetism, yet induction doesn't work among point charges? Really? This is ridiculous. And even in vector magnetic potentials, they even state the equation for vector magnetic potentials may be written in differential form if we again agree not to attribute any physical significance to the result until the entire closed path in which current flows is considered. They even admit it doesn't apply. It only applies to closed paths. And I said, this is ridiculous. Okay. The very fact that I can make the source of the magnetic field reducible to a point should mean the effects from a source to a target should be independent and isolatable. So there is no field construct in classical theory that allows you to compute the effect on a point charge A due to the acceleration of point charge B. None. None whatsoever. You can go into all the books you want, you will not find diddly squat. You'll get inconclusive answers. And so this video series shows the search for a point charge forms for all the electrical effects beginning with induction. And you will be astonished that just by getting the correct models of electromagnetic induction, where it leads. So on the road ahead, you can read this on your own. Some of these are going to change up a little bit. So, but thank you very much. Thank you. If people are donating, I appreciate that. We're getting close to 1,000 subscribers. That's awesome. If you could give me thumbs up, get the word out, uh, yada, yada, yada. And I do appreciate the people that are donating. I'm starting to get more donations, and, and, that, and people are starting to put me on monthly automatic things. That's really awesome. I thank you. If you want to donate, go to my website. There's a donate button. Uh, if I can do this full time, I can get this done a heck of a lot faster and make sure that it's all public because, you know, if, if, if I got to do this all by myself, I'm going to want to hold stuff back in patents. But if I'm getting enough to do this full time, I'll just release everything. 
Uh, and because I'm getting donations, I'm going to release something I haven't released before in video number three. It'll be pretty interesting. So thank you. If you go to my website, my website's woefully out of date. It's distinti.com. The first page, you'll find a donate button. Thank you very much.